My name is Richard August, and I'll be your host. Our guest tonight is House Minority Leader Mike Chippendale, who represents District 40, which includes Foster, Gloucester, and Coventry. Welcome back to State of the State. Thanks for having me, Richard. In our last program, we were joined by Representative Jason Knight, who is a strong advocate for gun control legislation. Leader Chippendale, on the other hand, is often opposed to stronger gun laws. Leader Chippendale, ever since the horrific mass shooting in 2012 at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, bills that would ban the manufacture, sale, or possession of assault weapons have been introduced in the General Assembly and have failed to pass. Our neighboring states, Connecticut and Massachusetts, as well as eight other states and the District of Columbia, have passed a ban on these military-style firearms. Why does anyone need one of these weapons of war? Uh, well, I, I first question your, your uh, classification as, as a weapon of war. Um, anything can be a weapon of war, frankly. Uh, in, in World War II, we helped liberate France with single-shot uh, firearms called liberators. They fired one bullet and they were done, and they worked very well at doing what they were doing. So anything can be a weapon of war. Uh, why does anyone need what, uh, what this bill describes an assault weapon? Um, because that's what the Second Amendment was written for. The Second Amendment was not written so that I would have the right to go shoot ducks and deer. The Second Amendment was written so that I could shoot tyrants. And when I need to shoot tyrants, I need military firepower. It's as simple as that. That is what the Second Amendment is about. And I know that people hearing that may cringe, but they need to open up their history books and refresh their memories. But aren't these rifles simply designed to like, lay down a field of fire on the battlefield so that when you come to a mass shooting scenario, they're able to just mow down all kinds of people? Uh, you know, you can use a, a, a weapon, a firearm, to, to mow down people. You can also use a D8 bulldozer reinforced with steel to plow down an entire town, which we saw in American history. People who want to do bad things will do bad things, and they'll use whatever they want to use or can use. Now, Megan Rainey, I think that's the way she pronounces her name, who was an ER doctor at Rhode Island Hospital, has testified locally and then actually in Congress to the traumatic wounds she sees inflicted by these high-powered bullets fired by assault rifles. Again, wh why does a civilian need to own a firearm that can do this kind of damage to the human body? I will reflect on my first answer. It's the Second Amendment protects our ability to have that so that we can uh, defend ourselves, our families, and our state and our nation. Uh, Dr. Rainey um, certainly can talk about the traumatic effect of, of a gunshot wound in the emergency room because she's seen them. I'm sure she can talk about uh, car accidents and the horrible things or falling off a building buildings and the horrible trauma that that causes as well. It does not qualify her as an expert on the Second Amendment, so I dismiss her opinion completely. Now, the assault rifle ban before the House, which I think is H7217, includes a section that was added, I guess, a couple of years ago that allows a person who owns such a firearm, if and when the bill becomes law, to keep that gun and pay a $25 modest fee per person, not per assault rifle. Doesn't this satisfy the Second Amendment community? You can keep the firearms even after this bill becomes law. With that grandfathering uh, portion of the bill, you're also required to submit the fingerprints, uh, all sorts of data that you have to give to the police chief. Um, and the, uh, if, when, when you pass away, if I were to pass away with a grandfather firearm, I would not be able to transfer uh, that, that firearm to my child. Uh, furthermore, it requires registration of all of the firearms, which is strictly prohibited by Rhode Island law. We cannot register firearms. We register firearms, that's the first step, as history has told us, to confiscation. Now, another bill, which is eight, H7051, I believe, is before the House uh, this week, which would prohibit outdoor shooting ranges within one mile of a school. Do you oppose this legislation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Isn't this a common sense safety measure? I mean, aren't kids entitled to go to school and not have to listen to 
gunshots from a range nearby? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, that argument could be made. However, the gun shot, uh, the gun ranges that are in question here, all that would be affected, were in, were in place before the schools were. And while um, inside the school, I, it is doubtful that they can hear uh, firearms uh, being uh, being shot. Uh, I'm sure it compares to nothing uh, when they get home and strap on the headphones and play Call of Duty with their friends. So I don't think uh, the sound of gunfire is going to be frightening today's school children. But you're still opposed to this bill because I'm, I'm opposed to the bill because we have a law that specifically states if a gun, uh, a bona fide gun range is, is in place, no law can supersede it and put it out of business, which is exactly what this bill would seek to do. Are these commercial ranges or? Um, n n I don't believe any of the commercial ranges in the state fall within a, a mile of, of, of a uh, school, but I may be wrong on that. Uh, my district, uh, my town has five uh, gun ranges in it, and some of them do fall within a mile of the schools. However, again, they were there well before the schools. The forests throughout the western part of Rhode Island echo with gunfire all around every school in every neighborhood because it's called hunting season. And children hear this and it is not a traumatic um, um, episode for school children to hear uh, guns being fired. Well, you would agree that for someone in the inner cities like Providence or Central Falls, uh, when they hear gunfire, they know there's some problems. So, you know, I, are you talking about kids that live in a rural or semi-suburban uh, environment that are, but for an inner city child? Is, well, I, I just quarrel with the premise that hearing a gunshot is somehow uh, traumatic and needs to stop. Um, I'm not, I know that this is one representative uh, responding to uh, a handful of people who happen to have moved into a neighborhood where, where a gun range existed and don't like the sound of gunfire. And this is their attempt to shut down that gun range. It's typical abuse of power that happens in the legislature all the time. Now, speaking of local cases, uh, there was a, uh, uh, I think everybody's in the audience and you are aware of a case where an individual in the northern part of the state had amassed a large arsenal of firearms. So a, and he shouldn't have had any, I guess. And a bill uh, H7269 has been filed that would limit the number of guns a person can purchase to one every 30 days. What's the problem with this legislation? Um, the argument that has uh, surrounded this bill, which goes back to the 90s, as early as I can recall, perhaps even uh, earlier than that, um, some of the arguments are such uh, as uh, folks who shoot in cowboy shoots. Maybe they need to purchase three different firearms, and that may be necessitated within a one-month period. Look, um, it, the, the, the person in Burrowville was a mentally ill individual who the police had flagged, who had been engaged in activity that was disqualifying him from owning a firearm in the first place. So when the other side uses these arguments and finds these very specific one-off cases, uh, um, to try to make a point, it, it doesn't really uh, make a point with me because you can find one-off episodes to describe just about any scenario you want. And in this case, it falls short. If someone has one firearm, what does allowing them to buy two? They only have two hands. What is allowing them to buy three a month or four a month going to do? If they want to do something bad with a firearm, they already have one. Or if they want to, they can buy one. It, it, stopping them from buying more than one has no practical um, application towards crime, uh, stopping crime or law enforcement. So this individual um, who you have said had some mental incapacity or was mentally disturbed was still able to accumulate a, a vast number of farms. How, these, how did he do this? He simply lied on the federal form 4473, which for each time he lied was a felony. And that is why we will never see him walking on the streets again. The law worked, the law was in place, it was a federal law, he's in jail, and we won't hear from him anymore. So you, you don't think there should be a limit on the number of firearms a person can own? I, I see no reason why there should be a limit. There's a bill called, uh, well, I don't know what it's called, but it's 7268, 
which would require, <coughs> excuse me, every purchaser to pass a basic firearm safety test and possess, I believe, either a hunter safety card or what's called a so-called blue card. Um, shouldn't someone be willing to pass a safety course to buy a gun? I mean, don't, don't we already do this for driver's licenses? Yeah, yeah, you know, in, in my experience, Richard, um, uh, the folks with whom I shoot, with whom I hunt, uh, those with whom I associate, they all have either a blue card and a hunter safety card. Many have military ID cards, which, which cover both of those. Um, uh, responsible firearm owners take ser uh, safety very seriously. If you want to become a member of my gun club, you must demonstrate that you understand safe firearm handling and the safe use of firearms. Um, again, responsible firearm owners are not the problem here. Uh, these are the, the people who don't know uh, what they're doing. They see what they see on TV and they think they can just go buy a firearm and, and be a bad guy. Uh, that's not uh, the people that we s shoot with at the range, that we hunt with in the forests. It's just not the, the law-abiding gun, gun owner. But right now there is a, a requirement to, to get a hunting license, you have to pass a hunter safety course mm -hmm. with the state. To buy a handgun, you have to have what's called a blue card, correct? Yes, or a hunter safety card or a valid military ID. Any one of those three will, will allow you to purchase a handgun. So this bill would also require that blue card or some evidence of, of competency with a firearm to purchase rifles and shotguns too, wouldn't it? That's, yes, it would. Why, why wouldn't we require that for all firearms? Uh, the, the argument support or opposing this is that you don't need uh, to, to demonstrate anything to exercise a constitutionally protected civil right. You don't need to go to journalism school to use your First Amendment right. You don't need to go uh, to, to, uh, to the seminary and become a priest to preach the gospel. Uh, the same thing applies with every one of our God-given constitutionally protected rights. Currently, um, the blue card can be, uh, the test, I'm sorry, for test for a blue card can be administered by a firearms dealer yes. um, or even a shooting range. Um, and then it seems to me that this, these parties administering the test have a vested interest in seeing that you pass the test. I believe this bill says, okay, the state, the Department of Environmental Management will administer these tests. It doesn't, doesn't that seem a little odd that we're allowing people to have a vested interest in making sure you get a gun? To, to administer a test? Uh, not at all, because if they uh, were to cheat the system and just give the blue cards away or give the answer key away and something uh, were to happen, their federal firearms license would be gone and they would be in jail. They have every incentive in the world to make sure that those people uh, who are purchasing or seeking to purchase are so qualified, which does mean that they have to have those uh, safety um, cards in their possession. The um, bill that seems to have legs, let us put it that way, is what's called the Safe Storage Act, mm -hmm. which is H7373, I believe. And it's designed to place guns that may be accessed by children and those not allowed to own firearms in a secure storage. And failure to do so would be uh, called criminal storage of a gun which could result in a prison term of not more than five years and not more than $5,000 or both. Now, wouldn't this cut down on the number of suicides and accidental shootings by children? Uh, you know, somebody goes to a play day at their friend's house and they can, this other house has firearms and the kid picks it up and something yeah, bad happens. Certainly, if there are irresponsible people who leave firearms around where there are children uh, able to access them, those people are engaging in reckless behavior and need to be dealt with. Uh, once again, I reflect back on the responsible firearm owners in the community of which I'm a member, uh, and this practice is just not done. First of all, we raise our children to understand firearm safety. Second of all, we would never leave them in a place or in a condition where a child would be able to get to them. As far as your suicide question, there are several modalities to suicide. 
several. Uh, the access to a firearm does not make one more inclined to commit suicide. It may make it quicker for them, but it does not make them more inclined to do so. If someone has their heart set on, on ending their lives, um, which is unfortunately too, too common today and it's a horrible thing, uh, they will find a way. So to deprive a, a person who is otherwise a peaceable person who abides by the law from the ability to defend themselves and their family by requiring firearms to be locked up to the extent where they cannot be accessed in an emergency is reckless and endangers the lives of more people than it would ostensibly save. So you obviously do not support this, this type of legislation? Absolutely not. Okay. Um, Bill H-7216 would require police departments to send two fired cartridge cases from any gun used in a crime or a ghost gun to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, the federal agency. Is there a problem with doing that? There are several departments across the country that do this voluntarily. Um, and my issue with this uh, is twofold. First of all, we have several small departments in the state, uh, some of which I represent because I represent the rural part of the state. I have a police department with a total of nine police officers in it. Um, if we had to, upon every interaction with a firearm, fire two shell casings, First of all, you need to have a facility to do that. We don't have a facility to do that. You would have to collect the shell casings. There would have to be a, 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 a form that demonstrates that the chain of custody was never broken. It would then be sent to, as far as I know, the only machine that does this is in the Attorney General's office. So we would be sending every single, uh, two of every single firearm shell casings to the Attorney General's office to be inventoried. Then what happens? If someone gets caught with a firearm, firearm that was stolen and they commit a horrible crime and they get busted for it. And then they find out that that shell casing is in the system being attached to four or five other horrible crimes. What happens now? Does that person then get charged for all of them? Um, or do we just wipe those cases off the books? I don't know. All I know is I don't want the attorney general being the one who's doing the analysis of, of evidence when he's also the person in charge for putting the person behind bars who, the, who, where the evidence came from. Um, I don't think that's a, a good system. And certainly it's a waste of time and resources, money and human resources for departments like those that I represent. So your understanding of this bill, and perhaps uh, I, mis I misunderstood it when I read it, these casings would be sent to the attorney general's office for analysis and store and cataloging and inventorying those is that that is correct at, the, at this point i am only aware of the attorney general owning uh, the equipment that does this so what it would, what it will do it will look at the imprint the fingerprint if you will uh, that the firing pin leaves on the primer mm -hmm. that will be cataloged very unique just like a human fingerprint it will look at the striations on the shell casing uh, which come from the ejector which come from the chamber um, and those are all unique to the firearm so you can fingerprint a shell casing to an exact uh, chamber of a firearm. And I question the value in that. If you have a firearm and you have a defendant and you can prove that that defendant used that firearm in that crime, you have everything you need. I don't understand why you need to go back and try to tie this to, to other crimes when it's been admitted by law enforcement that they won't pursue those crimes. Because there's no guarantee that the person who they're there's the, looking at for absolutely. that crime used them in previous crimes. You just have absolutely. what you think the, the evidence would be. Oh, it's like I found your fingerprints at the scene of the crime, but what does that prove? And, and well, it's even worse than that because the, these stolen guns oftentimes get hand around, handed around. You know, in, in, uh, uh, criminal A steals it, does a crime, then it's hot, trades it with criminal B for whatever, uh, who trades it with criminal C. Who knows how many crimes were done with it mm -hmm. and who gets to wear the crown of all of those crimes is the question. There's no due process. I think I, it, so it has no real value to, is from my perspective in solving the crime at hand, which again, you have the evidence to do. Yep. Well, let's talk about a bill I suspect that you do support, which is H-7270, broadly described as a Concealed Carry Reform Act. It would do several things. One, allow the Attorney General to enter into agreements with other, with other states to recognize that state's concealed carry permit if certain requirements are met. Two, 
It defines a suitable person and reasons for carrying a concealed carry permit, for having a concealed carry permit. Three, specify the information required on a concealed carry permit application. Four, establish an informal and formal appeal process when a concealed carry permit is denied. And five, provide that records relating to concealed carry permit and ap appeals would not be a public record. Do you support this legislation and why? As a matter of fact, I do support it. Uh, we, we had crafted a very similar piece of legislation. It did not have the reciprocity portion to it. And that did pass the Assembly in 2014, or it passed the House in 2014. Uh, it did not pass the Senate. Um, the concealed weapons laws in our state are a, a hodgepodge of, of various sections that sometimes contradict and, and um, don't necessarily work very well together. Uh, they lack a lot of legal definition definitions, which, which is uh, critical when trying to interpret how to uh, apply a law. So there is gr a great need for reform. Uh, as far as reciprocity for concealed carry, um, I do support reciprocity in certain cases. Um, it's been my position, and this is just my position, uh, that if we're going to honor a state's concealed weapons permit, um, then that state must have an aptitude test, just like Rhode Island does. Uh, and, and I'd have to read the exact language of the bill to see because we've had so many versions of reciprocity over the years. Yeah. Uh, some of them have had that standard. Some of them were just strict reciprocity. Now, if you give reciprocity to a state that has constitutional carry, as you know, um, there is no requirement for that person to ever even have ever fired a firearm before they can carry it. So I think I would want to look at that a little bit more closely. Uh, but the general premise of the bill, we absolutely have to reform the concealed carry section of our laws. The, you talk about constitutional carry, which basically says that the United States, and in some cases the state constitution, provides for the yeah. owner and carrying of a firearm, sometimes concealed, sometimes open. And so that those states, I think there's about 25 or 26 states that have that now. So those states were not, the person couldn't simply come in and say, well, I live in state X that has this, therefore you must honor it. We're saying, I believe the bills, that's why they're talking about certain requirements. Mm -hmm. The attorney general could look at the requirements for that state and say, yes, there are, you know, they match ours, so therefore you can, is that? Yeah, so again, if as long as there are uh, standards in that state's uh, issuance of concealed weapons permit that include the aptitude test, that, that demonstrate, that uh, provide that you must demonstrate you have aptitude with that firearm, I have no issue with reciprocity. No, I think, um, as you say, you probably haven't looked at this year's bill, but I did, and it, interestingly enough, we have two approaches to obtain a concealed carry permit in Rhode Island, as you know. One is you can apply to a municipality and pa passing whatever criteria they establish, they shall issue. On the other hand, you can apply it to the attorney general and you do whatever they want, but they say his law says he or she may issue. Yeah. This bill says, okay, we're gonna strike that and both the attorney general and the municipal issuing uh, authorities would have a shall issue clause. Yes. Is, is that necessary? Is it? Is uh, there... Yeah. Yeah. I think it is necessary. But we, in order for that to work, we have to again going back to the legal definitions. We have to we have to define what is a qualified person. We have to define what is reasonable um, need. Uh, we have to define those things in law, so it's not arbitrarily up to the person who's reviewing the application. And what's happened over the past, I would say, ten to fifteen years, is that most uh, localities, most local police chiefs. Uh, and largely because they didn't have the time uh, or the manpower to do the work, uh, weren't approving and, and consequently they were getting sued. They were costing their taxpayers a lot of money because they were losing in every single, uh, almost every single case. Uh, so rather than continuing to have the state and our municipalities sued, costing taxpayers money and losing in the end, I think we ought to reform the law, make the standard pretty simple for anyone to understand, even the Attorney General, and then just pass it into law and, and, and that pulls, puts that whole issue behind us. Do you know whether or not the Attorney General supports this bill? Oh, he would never support this. He doesn't support private firearm ownership. At all, even though? From what I can tell and from all the testimony he's given in his entire time in office, he does not support any of our firearm rights. 
Now, I believe this bill would also allow a person with a concealed carry permit to carry a gun concealed or openly when an emergency evacuation order is in effect. Why would someone need to carry a gun in such a situation? Well, I mean, just think of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, you, you may not have been there, but we know of a lot of horrible things that happened. Uh, think about earthquakes. Think about uh, COVID lockdowns. Think about the summer of 2020. If I'm trying to get my family out of a city where they're tipping over police cars, burning police cars down, uh, looting and robbing stores, I damn well will be carrying a firearm and it will be out opening up for everyone to see. Um, in general, the, we're all, I think, familiar with the Second Amendment, which was written in 1787. And at the time, the firearms were single shot, muzzle loading mm -hmm. firearms. And today, of course, we have come a long way, so to speak. And we have everything from what I describe as military style firearms and everything in between. So, do you really think the Second Amendment applies today the same way it did when the Constitution was passed? Well, let me ask or you this. Adopted, I should The say. Constitution was written with a feather and dipped in ink, and that was how you wrote in the same time period. Does the First Amendment only apply to those things written with a quill and an ink? No. It evolved with newspapers, with Gutenberg, with the printing press. It evolved with the Internet. The Fourth Amendment evolved with, uh, with um, heat uh, imaging uh, uh, apparatus to spy into people's houses. So yes, the Constitution is absolute in that regard. Whatever the weaponry of the day is, and I think Heller, the, the Heller decision makes this pretty clear, um, um, is what the Second Amendment is speaking about. So yes, it absolutely applies to the firearms we have today. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears. We have a few minutes left and I wanna to talk to you about a couple of other pieces of legislation that seem to be hot topics. One of them being a reform, the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. Um, can you describe for us the, what, the, what changes are they looking for and what is the chances of some type of reform happening in that bill. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> this issue uh, gained a lot of, of, of profile, high profile during 2020 um, when a lot of my colleagues were trying to uh, abolish the police and defund them. Um, and what, what, we're, we're, what we're seeing is people who want the police to have no protections from anything. They just want them to be fair game. Uh, the police want to have some protections from um, false claims or, or, or uh, nuisance claims, frivolous uh, uh, complaints against them. Somewhere in the middle, there needs to be a little give and take. This bill has been um, worked on by the law enforcement professionals, both active and retired, in, in the assembly, uh, along with the interested parties on both sides, on all sides. And they have come up with a compromise bill uh, that both both sides have agreed and have put forward. It uh, offers, uh, without getting to, into, into the fine minutia of it, it offers the administration in the police department, the brass, a little bit more leeway to put uh, an officer in question behind a desk and say you're not going to be on the street or to even suspend uh, without pay. Um, and that is, to some people, not enough. Uh, to some people, that is too much. Uh, at the end of the day, I will rely on the opinion of the three chiefs of police in my district, as well as the law enforcement officers I know, um, and the law enforcement officers I serve with. If this bill is, is okay with them, it's okay with me. Um, I think also one of the reasons for the bill is to um, avoid retaliation by someone who's an elected uh, official, and, and there's a confrontation with the police. You don't want them to say, well, I'm going to get you because I'm you know, Certainly. a big shot. We, we saw something like that on the news this summer, I, if, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm not. Um, but yeah, that, that could certainly play into it. Um, however, uh, the police have to feel um, safe in the execution of their duties, uh, especially with the ubiquity today of cell phone cameras, uh, everything they do being filmed, body-worn chest cameras that they have on themselves. Um, they are under the microscope. Uh, if, a, if a police officer engages in a way that is not respectful to that honorable profession, that person needs to be dealt with. And we saw that in Pawtucket, and that person should not be a police officer, should have never been let back out on the streets. 
Well, Leader Chippendale, we want to certainly thank you for coming back and visiting us again, and good luck for the rest of the thank session. You. We want to thank you, our audience, for tuning in to State of the State and kind of looking at the other side of the issue with respect to gun control legislation. Thank you for joining us.